I think because of all my plein air self-training, I love to start with the shape of light. Uh, we've been looking at a lot of um, sort of uh, Japanese influenced paintings today, and a lot of times that's the shape of the dark that they're using a lot of times in that. I think that carries over from just having that spot of ink that you can use and making that such an important thing. Um, but the shapes are going to remain the same, and it doesn't really matter. You know, you could invert any of those paintings and still have beautiful designs. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to go the way that I'm used to work. I'm looking at the way the, the light spills down in this passage right here, from where I'm standing. If I crop this so that this enters onto the canvas and just moves down through here, it, it looks so much like that shape of dark that I made, that calligraphy that just moved down. Mm -hmm. I just think that's just a beautiful way to you know, uh, make the painting about. So at this point, would you push the... Um the pattern of light to get a better design? Of course, yes. So um, that's, that's exactly all I'm interested in doing. But I mean, I'm looking for finding a beautiful design in that, and finding mm -hmm. the influence of that, you know. And then I just try and pull the most beautiful parts of that into here, embellish the poetry of that, you know. Um, if I go too far off of what's there, it's going to be hard for me to come up with a, a justification for it a lot of times. I might, you know, if I want this spot to get you know this shape instead of this shape it may not be a flower anymore. So I really do want to find something in here uh, which is a beautiful and elegant shape and just frame it in such a way on the canvas that it moves us through. If you have a flower here that you like the shape of, uh -huh. but it doesn't tie into the lights down mm -hmm. here, but if you moved it down two inches Exactly you would do that. Okay. Okay. That was a great question. Okay. Because I get caught with that thinking I have to no, right. I move it. You can't just move something. You're going to have to invent what goes behind where it used to be. Right. So the more of that I do, the more I say around. myself yeah. to have to invent things or come up with an interesting way of obfuscating that. Um, we can never just move something. We're creating a hole. Right. When we move that thing, now we have to invent what was behind it. So uh, as long as you're up to that task, you know, if it's just a couple of stems going behind it, and you just make those stems longer, yeah, it's a really easy, great thing to do. Um, if you have you know half of a person behind that, and you know that you're going to have to make up the other half of the person, it's probably not so likely to just need it. Those spare arms and legs. I think that it'll be on YouTube. It'll be connected. So, but if I'm looking at this shape of the light hitting the groove over here, and I decide that that would be better if it comes off the bottom, do I move that groove down a little bit? Do that, do that. Um, do I elongate the shape of that light if I can get away with it? You know, however, I want to do it. Um, in this case, actually, there's an opportunity within this space to put just a little bit of line work, and I look over here to see if there is, and sure enough, there's that lily in here with the stem. It's just catching a little bit of highlight. Um, I didn't find that as part of my overall shape of light. It easily could have fit into a middle. But when I look for this shape and want something there, that's when I see it. Right? So somebody asked a question, my venue. When you go out in nature, are you, um, or maybe it was you, uh, but when you go out in nature, you know, are those shapes just already there? Well, they're, they're, the, the inspiration is there. But once you learn what design you want to be doing, once you learn what shapes you want to be making on your canvas, you'll be able to find those shapes of nature. And that's exactly what's happening here. So knowing that I wanted to have a little bit of a, a calligraphic light in here to break that space helped me see that there was some opportunity for that. When I'm putting in the shape of my dark, I'm looking at the overall shape of the light, the shape of the middle for the proportion and placement of it. But I'm still going to draw the shape of that dark accurately. So when I come in with this, and I see that this is only this far away from this dark, but in my light, I've got it, I would have to put it here to make it line up. I put it where it goes. Now I've just set a dark over where my light used to be, okay? But next time I come back through and I put my lights on, I'm going to have that dark as a frame of reference, and my light will get a little bit more accurate. I'm not going to do it off of where the dark is. I'm going to do it based on where everything is. The dark will be a little bit more of a guide for me, and I may end up putting my light 
over this dark. And the next time I come over the dark, I have to keep moving things a little bit. But instead of just following the initial shape that I put down, I'm painting each thing over it accurately and separate from the others. Okay, and that's going to tighten up my drawing every time I make a pass through this paint. I'm looking at this and I'm seeing there's a, a kind of sameness to these shapes as far as the scale and size of them. One thing we have to be careful of in design is spotty darks. Because it's easy for the darks just to show up, you know, at the base of each object and so on. If we broaden our interpretation of what a dark is, we have a, and we do this in value viewer, right? You see we've been doing that in the paintings on the first class. Instead of taking all those little spots of dark, if we broaden the idea of what a dark is, we only have three values. Now instead of saying anything that's darker than an eight is a dark, what if we say anything that's darker than a six and a half is a dark? Now we have a shape of dark that describes light versus shadow. It describes form more, okay, because we have masses. And so I'm looking at looking for a dark which goes from being a form to a complicated line, which is descriptive of texture, calligraphy into a line, which is poetic, interesting shape and a way to move through the space of the canvas, and then back into a, a complicated shape and then back to a simple mass. I'm looking for those shapes. And according to where I draw the line of how dark or light a value has to be before I call it a dark or you know, call it a middle, uh, I'm going to get different shapes. right? So I want to choose the place on that value scale that's going to give me the most elegant shapes of dark purple and light. So if I get to this point in the painting and I just go, yeah, that whole design is just not holding up. I'm going to step back and I just, I just turn my canvas sideways. You've seen me do it if you've gone out plein air with me. I'll just turn the canvas sideways, step back, rub it down, and start a new design on it. Um, if I had taken all day to draw all this stuff in, and then I step back and look at my design and don't like it, do you think I'm really going to you know, be mm -hmm. open to the idea mm -hmm. of just wiping right. it off? Right, right. Um, so this is another, another way to keep the designs important, is by throwing it down quickly and evaluating it and then deciding whether you're going to use it. That's going to be a cool design. At this point, you know, it's already kind of successful. I like the... Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the overall shape of this, we're going from a mass kind of into a line. There's a space between them. It's kind of using the canvas, but in a very asymmetrical way. Um, you know, these bits of light down here are going to have uh, these petals too. It's going to be more of a staccato pattern kind of thing. It's going to grab more attention than a big shape like that. This is an elegant shape, but it also um, is more simple than these little orphan shapes. So it's, and when I say orphan, I mean a shape that's no longer connected to the big mass, right? Mm -hmm. So these spots that sit the off, sheep, that, be, that are, yeah, the, the sheep that's away from the flock. Now one of the things that you'll see uh, Bachman doing, Carlson doing, Pinkham doing, um, is deciding that, okay, once you have those three values of interlocking shape, uh, how dark do I make my darkest dark? How light do I make my lightest light? Those guys are, and not George Carlson, but Neil Carlson. Neil Carlson, Dan Pinkham, and John Faulkner. They're compressing those values. You still have this feeling of naturalism because the shapes of it are the same, but it's almost like you're taking a photograph of something and then washing it out a little bit. So you have this hazy kind of view. It's very atmospheric, and it makes everything feel a little more poetic and harmonic. Um, you can think of it as a sliding scale between uh, contrast and harmony. Okay, now that works with value, works with color. Uh, you know, how harmonic are your colors? Well, are they all lumped together over here in the blues? Are they all? Uh, are they? You know, all over the palette? You know, and, and full saturation. That's a contrast piece. You put gray into all of them, so they're all at about 20% saturation. Now you have all of those colors coming in together, but in a harmonic way, right? Or if we take a, a, a whole painting and make it all out of very similar colors, they could be higher saturation, but they're all greens, purples, blues, okay? We have harmony again. And then maybe for your contrast, you're adding in a, uh, something that's a warm, but it's a very gray warm against that. So then we have a harmonic painting. Same thing in value. 
you can take something with very strong lights, very strong darks, and have that that graphic shape of you know hard design going on. And uh, you're going to have the same design in say an Edgar Payne with a high contrast, where he's pushed a lot of dark into those shadows, and we feel that strong sunlight and that drama of the scene. Versus if you had Twachman doing that or Pinkham doing that, and they're using um, instead of instead of their dark paint being like a nine or a ten kind of blackish kind of paint, they're using for their shape of dark something that's like a five, mm -hmm. right? And then it feels almost a little foggy. It feels ethereal. It's maybe moonlit. It's um, you know just this softer, more poetic, harmonic kind of feeling. Same design in the Twachman in the in the um, uh, Emil Carlson paintings as you have in the Edgar Payne painting, but with a different amount of contrast and a different value scale going on in the painting, and using harmonic uh, colors and values instead of contrasting colors and values, you get a completely different mood. And that's how we're using one of the main compositional elements, which is value, uh, to help create the mood and reinforce the mood that's within the piece. Okay. So, um, are we trying to show uh, the intensity of, of the subject? Well, you know, on, on some subjects that might be really appropriate, right? Um, if we have uh, maybe, if we just keep this in the ocean, we've got like maybe this big fishing boat or something like that. And, and it's about industry versus nature and the drama of all this kind of stuff. <laughs> we might have that big, dark mass of that boat set up against the light, the shining on the sea, and all this high contrast kind of coming. Together, and then you have a lot of drama in it. If you take the whole thing and you put it under moonlight, like your steam, your tugboat painting that you got by Mitchell, and the whole thing is very soft, and you have the same shapes of design, that beautiful, elegant shape of design that's in that painting, um, but you put everything in a softer light, then you have this restful, sort of um, contemplative piece, you know, and everything feels a little more still and quiet. You can almost hear the crickets, you know. Um, and that's just being done by contrast using the same shape. So that's what you were talking about yesterday with my big painting. You about it's all about harmony. Yeah, that's a like harmony. Piece, right? yeah, getting ready, my you know, yeah. If you if you look at that chorus scene and look at some of Emil Carlson's yeah. chorus scenes, he's using so little contrast in his paintings, and that's giving this very restful, you know, very comfortable painting to look at. You can you can put that up and just relax. Mm -hmm. It's going to suck some of the energy out of your house when you hang that up. Right? <laughs> it's going to just dial everything down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. If you put in, um, look at for a, a contrast painter, like an Edgar Payne, and you put that in your living room, you walk in and there's that impact, there's that drama, right? It's got a very um, sort of overtly masculine kind of feel to it, rather than this restful, you know, more, more feminine energy that's coming from the harmonic side of things. And so, um, you know, According to what you are trying to accomplish in that room, are you trying to stage that for drama and impact? And you know, I mean, it's really impressive. You come in and you have that big edge of paint, and you know, maybe your dark panel wood kind of you know room, and you know, you've got a lot of drama going on. Versus if you're doing something kind of um, white and modern, and then you put up, you know, a big uh, Twachman piece or something like that, and it's very soft, and you're like, wow, there's just this beautiful, elegant, restful quality right to the room. So. According to what you're trying to convey in the work, you, know, you want to choose your value scale accordingly. Okay. So it's a transition from dark into middle. I'm doing that in order to lose some edges of stuff going on. It's a peripheral area of the painting. Those edges are explained and articulated, and the value shifts in there if I want to define them. But instead, I'm going to choose not to find them and let that be a transition, let that area go a little more out of focus. Okay, and you're talking about. The interlocking shape that, that what? The interlocking shape is going to be the calligraphy between the lit side of the mass and the shadow side of the mass. Which, well, uh, interlocking shape gets used. That's sort of the macro scale of it. Okay. But on the small scale, where we're breaking down and talking about edges and transitioning an edge from a lit side of something to a shadow side of it, we're getting a smaller area of the canvas. And we're doing that same thing. We're having interlocking shapes, and that's calligraphy going on. So that's like where you have the petals of the flower against the shadow. It'll be, yeah, I mean, very much in right here, we'll have some calligraphy uh -huh. going on to describe. And that's, that calligraphy that happens in here is going to say paper daisy. Okay. And if I get that calligraphy right, 
I can lose almost the whole rest of the flower. And we're going to know. Because those are our descriptive, elegant shapes. I want to design them. I want to make sure they're beautiful and there's a nice rhythm to them, that they're not all the same thickness all the way around. It would be easy to do. Draw the shape of that petal with a dark line around it, or a middle value line around it, right? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make sure that that's an elegant shape. I'm going to look on that flower for the elegance in that shape. It's proactive viewing. It's, it's viewing to look for the things that are beautiful. So I have a dark mass in here. And then in between the flowers, we have this shape coming through here and connecting down into this. This becomes the line, connecting these masses. Also, it defines what the shape of these petals are. If I look at this line right now, it's the same thickness, and it's just a straight line all the way through. So that automatically, without even looking at the subject, is that the most elegant portrayal of that space? No. no. We want to find it going from thick to thin. We want to have an interesting edge. So the first thing I saw when I looked at that was that line going through. So I hit that. But I know that's not a great shape. Okay. So now I'm going to go back and proactively look at that. I'm going to look a little more closely, and I'm going to find What's going to make this a more beautiful shape? And as I look, I see that this is actually a shadow falling on these two petals here. As it does that, the shape of this comes and defines the space between them. There's a broken edge to that. And this scoots around the edge of that petal like this. And it gets a little bit thinner as it goes up to the top, and I'm going to have to draw that in what I'll call a positive shape, the shape of the light in this case. So that's the shape of the flower. making it both more descriptive and more poetic. Both more descriptive and more poetic, and we will find over and over that those things go together. So now I'm here, and I take the shape of that light. I'm going to thin down that line. Find another complication here. This way, which is nice. And this becomes more complicated, more calligraphic, more elegant, and more descriptive all at the same time. Do I want that everywhere in the whole painting? No. Oh. I want to choose the places that that is happening the most and um, where it's the most descriptive. If I paint every little facet of every single shape in this whole thing, I'm going to have um, something that is more of a news report than a poem, right? And I want to tell you about the poetry of this, not all the biology. So uh, in the shadows, great place to lose information. Right? Where shadow meets light, great place to give you information. Within the light, good place to lose information. Okay, It's, it's where the two are coming together that I give you a descriptive calligraphy. Now, within this shape, I am changing value. I'm going from my dark and then transitioning over to the middle. I'm also changing color. Um, I'm going to change it a little bit more. I won't have time to finish this whole painting, so I'm going to choose some spots of it that are helpful. Maybe you would never allow. Okay, maybe I'll do <laughs> But so I'm going to push in maybe a green here because it's going to an orange. Let that become an orange here, and maybe find a place for it to go purple too. Maybe on the top of here. That way, I'm using all of my secondary colors, right? I'd love to do that. We went this morning for the very first time. <laughs> so, I'm actually transitioning. Uh, there, there is an edge here where it goes from a dark to a middle. I'm going to let that be a transition just because. Um, that as I let go of that information within the shadow, that's a great place to let go of information. Right? So rather than over it, I'll just let it be sort of a transition and we can move through. And th then it becomes about what is the, what is the shape of the lit part of the flower versus the unlit part of the flower, and less about all the details of the local color and the stuff going on within the flower. And that's how we want to approach every subject. What's the shape of the light versus the mass of the shadow, and where's the calligraphy? that is both poetic and descriptive happen that comes together. Okay. 
forget about this stuff. Forget about the graphs. This spills right into a middle, which becomes this leaf. So I'm going to let it do that. So we go from a green to a purple to a yellow. It's going to go back to a green, but I'm not going to make it a green right at the edge of that leaf. George Carlson would do that. And we're looking at that one. How does he choose to move you from one place to the next? With, when he's got value on value, he puts that edge there and says, OK, this is green and this is orange. So we have that line is still happening, but it makes them exactly the same value through the act of traveling through it. I like to soften it in some places, and then it makes it even more about you know kind of light versus shadow and less about the edge of the optics within those places. Um, that's just stylistic difference. Yeah, either way works. right into these flowers. Because there's a lot of metal in here. Actually, that's a pretty good transition, too, because we have some backlit areas in here. Uh, we'll see if there's a way for that to wrap in on itself. It too. I'm going to take the shape off of this petal here, onto this leaf. I'm not going to change colors right where that happens. I'm actually going to start that green a little bit higher up here on the highlight of that leaf, um, just so that I make this a little bit more about shape than description of stuff. Okay. We let the eye travel. We make the shape more important than the thing, and that gives it a contemporary view. I'm also going to build the transition into this because we have, um, you know, as the light on this leaf gets down here, we're much farther away from that spotlight. The angle of incidence is, is, has fallen off. And so um, it's a good place for me to put that kind of transition in here. The value transition? So it'll be a value and a saturation transition. So as it gets farther away from the light, we're going to have a little bit less saturation. We're going to have a little bit darker color and a little bit cooler color. So I'm going to add in a little bit more um, blues and violets into this blue. And we'll let it go a little more yellow as it goes up towards the top. So And now I've made the shape of this value very important. I'm going to lose some of it here so that I don't have the shape of the object always outlined by something everywhere. I like to lose at least one part of the shape of every object, you know. But I prefer to lose a part over here, maybe travel through the object and then come out down here. The transition is going from to light into a middle, off of the object, and then back up against the object. Now I also have a color change happening in there, and we're changing, we're moving off of one object onto another one, which is a great opportunity for color change. I can change that color a lot more. Um, we're dealing with the shadow part of that cabbage. That could be um, really any color, but it's a natural uh, sort of purple kind of color because we're dealing with the shadow on white, much like we have this going into a gray lavender here. So there's a surface to this leaf. It's equilibrium. Like so 
I'm going to take that middle, and I'm going to look for where the shadow moves from lit side to shadow side and describes the surface. But that's a soft edge, and you just finished making a hard edge against the, uh, the middle against the light. <laughs> yes? Hold on. Oh. Um, you ain't done yet. Fine. Well, it seems that a hard edge directs more attention to that area, especially if it's uh, a hard edge. Yes, you know, the light and the dark. True, but it really yeah, depends on the contrast. There. So I'm using uh, the calligraphy of shape to connect those two masses of shadow, but also to describe the surface, the texture of them. That's going to give me a poetic, elegant, descriptive. And I connect it right into here, through here. And then back down into the leaf. I pulled that deliberately. You said that how it's sitting across there, but I pulled it deliberately into the shadow here. So I'm moving down into the rest. Because it's not just going to be about the shape of the light, it's also going to be about the shape of the middle. It's also going to be the shape of the dark. So I want the shape of this middle to be a tell. So I'm going to this one. I'm not really changing the design at this point, you know, because I'm mm -hmm. still just kind of keeping the shapes of light and the dark that they are. Uh, I may consolidate and unify some of the darks through here. Um, I think it will. But I'm not going to necessarily make them darker. You're just going to connect them? Yeah. Remember, that was one of the things that I wanted to um, do from the very first day in. When I come back and think about how to, you know, make the darks more of one solid shape, okay. um, and then I did it in my sketch. But I always know that if if I have to go back and deliberately do that, that's something I got to watch in this painting. Keep coming back and making sure that I don't lose that again. Because, you know, when I sketched in what I saw, I didn't see that big kind of graphic shape of dark. So uh, I have to, you know, as I paint, remember not to just keep painting the values that I'm seeing. Come back in and deliberately come back on. So you're creating that, right? I'm creating it, yeah. Yeah. By, by trying deliberately to see it is the best way to sum that up. Now, I'm putting that in as a value, but I always want to be thinking of it as a value and a color. Um, I may have a shadow that runs down the edge of this leaf like that. That gives me a little bit of a, a, a line to transfer, you know, from that mass to a line again. 